Hello. Uh, I'm Jim Ackerman, in case you don't know me. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Larry McClellan uh, for tonight's program. I want to call your attention to the two programs we have coming up. Actually, we are only announcing, only give, providing you information about the Arthur Holzheimer Maps in America lectures. Uh, we're not sponsors, but we certainly hope many people will venture up to Milwaukee to hear Karen Lewis um, talking on a topic quite related to tonight's talk. Um, that's Thursday, May 4th, so that's two weeks from today. Uh, two weeks after that, Patrick Ellis, who is the Assistant Professor of Communication at the University of Tampa, is going to be talking about maps to the stars, those maps of Hollywood movie stars as a cultural phenomenon. And uh, I've heard a bit of this talk. You'll, you'll really enjoy it. I hope you'll all come. So we are now ready to welcome Dr. Larry McClellan, who has worked at the Newberry uh, off and on for years and a number of projects. Um, he's written extensively on the Underground Railroad in Illinois and Northwest Indiana. And he was principal author of the applications that added sites in Crete, Lockport, and on the Little Calumet River to the National Park Service Registry as significant underground railroad sites in America. Those things don't just appear on these lists on their own accord. Somebody has to do the work to really make the case for them. Um, in 1970, he helped to start Governor State University and taught there for many years. He is now an emerit emeritus professor of sociology and community studies at GSU. In the late 1970s, I did not know this until this little note told me he was mayor of Park Forest South. Um, he was such a good good mayor that they they had to change the name of the of the town to University Park, Illinois. And uh, from 1993 to 2003, he wrote a monthly regional history column for the Star Newspapers, which is a South suburban publication. A uh, couple of other projects he wanted us to know about. One is Onward to Chicago, Freedom Seekers and the Underground Railroad in Northeastern Illinois, which will be published this summer by the Southern Illinois University Press. Um, and uh, there was a previous work on the Underground Railroad south of Chicago, which is now out of print. And then finally, To the River, The Remarkable Journey of Caroline Quarles, a Freedom Seeker on the Underground Railroad, which was published in 2019 and can be had from thorncreekpress.com, Thorn Creek Press. I'm sure you'd be happy to answer any questions you have about any of these publications and these projects. Obviously, they're all related in some way um, to what he's going to be talking about tonight, and we're really an, uh, honored to have him. Please welcome Dr. Larry McClellan. Well, let's see, am I on? Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Well. <clears throat> Perhaps we can lower it a little bit, or that it, it seems to be a little. Can we? There you go. Good, good, good. Uh, well, I'm delighted to, delighted to be with you. I shared with several of you as we we're talking that uh, years ago I was a member of the Map Society, but it was a real trek from Governor State to get up here, and so I made a couple meetings and then, you know, you know, dropped out. The um, another weird connection that would be of interest to you all. Um, is that I, I helped to start, I had a little hand in starting the Pontiac Oakland Car Museum in Pontiac, Illinois. And uh, as part of that process, I donated uh, to them my collection of roadmaps. And I 
So I, you know how these things happen. I had 4,000 roadmaps and, uh, and about 500 volumes on American travel and tourism and donated it all to the little car museum down there. And it's a wonderful place. If you wanna do a half a, a day trip sometime, go to Pontiac, Illinois. There's a set of free museums. It's really terrific. And forgive me if it's a little immodest, but I was really surprised a year ago, I went down to the car museum and they have taken their research area and they've named it the Dr. Larry McClellan Roadside Americana Library. And I'm not even dead. <laughs> and I, I thought, whoa, I thought, well, that's really nice. Well, I knew you'd appreciate that. So um, anyway, well, I'm delighted to be here talking with you about the Underground Railroad and all of my life in my teaching and in my research, maps have always been a very important part of that work. And you'll see some of that reflected uh, um, tonight. And of course, there is this first question of, well, the Underground Railroad in Illinois, how is that? The Underground Railroad was Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and all of that stuff on the East Coast. And that became a real question for me about 20 years ago. You know, was there really stuff happening here in Illinois? And I, as I was researching and working with people in the historic black communities south of Chicago, I would occasionally run into these references to the Underground Railroad. And so about 25 years ago, I decided to look seriously at this. And so the, all the research I've done and the books that have come out and all of this is kind of a, a consequence of that puzzle for the last 20 years. How do we understand that in fact, the Underground Railroad was a very, very significant activity here in, here in Illinois? And um, so to begin with, why, why did we end up having people escaping from their enslavement why did they come to Illinois? Why did they come to Chicago? And uh, that hangs on a very interesting question that is kind of, I don't mean in a philosophical way, but there is a question, why are we here? Why are we here? Why is Chicago here? And I think you of all folks have a really good understanding of why that is. That in fact, what we have in the Midwest is from Chicago, you know, from Chicago going to the east and the north is the Great Lakes water system. And from Chicago going west and south is the Mississippi River water system. And what is the point of transition between those two great systems? Well, it becomes, it becomes Chicago because in fact, we are sitting right on top of a continental divide. And all of that water through the Great Lakes goes out to the Atlantic and all the water, the other way it goes out to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, th there is this really kind of profound division right here. And people seeking their freedom coming up the Mississippi River Valley, of course, they're gonna end up coming up into Northern Illinois and, uh, and ending up at Chicago. And th this has been going on for, for thousands of years. Uh, Native American peoples understood that. And uh, we know that there were um, you know, well-established communities here in the Chicago area. We really need to be talking about the settlement of Chicago starting, the Chicago region starting about 1750, because that's when we have really well-established uh, indigenous communities. And serving those communities were a couple interesting pieces. The, uh, the, the historic Salt Trail, which went from the established uh, uh, native communities along the Mississippi River to deal with the foreigners, with the French and the British and so on in the Detroit area, um, a, a trail that's in existence for hundreds of years. And then uh, the Vincennes Trace coming up out of the Ohio River Valley and Native American folks understood these connections. And this becomes in a way the kind of template for why enslaved people can, you know, came up into our part of the world. Now, what about the Underground Railroad? First of all, of course, it was not a railroad and it was not underground. And we always have to be clear about that. Um, but this is a wonderful cartoon from 1844 from the Western Citizen, which was a very uh, staunch abolitionist newspaper. And of course it has the Liberty Line, it has the train going underground. But in fact, that is not, um, you know, it's, it's not real. What happened was in the 1830s, 
the great technological language of the day was the railroads. And it was no accident that as they began talking about, you know, these fugitives coming up and people helping them, that the language of, of lines and conductors and uh, passengers and all that language was, was very helpful. So by about 1840, the language of the Underground Railroad was being used to talk about the illegal activity to assist people that were seeking their freedom. Uh, probably uh, in the mid 1830s, two slave catchers in Kentucky were chasing some fugitives, um, uh, got them across, they got across the Ohio River and the uh, slave catchers were right on their tail and they got across the Ohio River and the, the, the fugitives were stone gone. And the story was that one of the slave catchers turned to the other and said, well, they are really gone. I think they just went on some underground road. And that story got passed among abolitionists and it became an underground railroad that was the mysterious way that people were getting to freedom. Uh, but it was not underground and it was not, uh, not a real railroad. It was the networks of response. Part of what I'm engaged in and a number of us around the country are doing is trying to seriously reframe the language of the Underground Railroad because historically it has been language about predominantly white, predominantly male conductors. And the fugitives are kind of the, the occasion for them to do heroic work. And we are trying to totally reframe that and talk not about fugitives, but about freedom seekers. In other words, to shift the language from seeing people identified by their illegal activity, which was of course illegal, but identifying them rather by their intention, that these were a, a remarkable group of human beings in the South who decided that they were going to find liberation for themselves and for their children. And so the language has to really shift so that we're talking about the movement and the agency of freedom seekers who are then assisted by people across, across the country. A second part of that reframing is to understand, and this is very difficult to communicate to people, is to understand that the Underground Railroad, the, the, the traditional language is a bunch of good white people created the Underground Railroad to help slaves. And not what happened. What happened was people in the South escaping their enslavement came north. And as they came north, they ran into white people and black people who helped them. And the white people and black people said, we got to help these folks. And over time, that response to the freedom seekers becomes the networks of the Underground Railroad. Okay, so you see that shift? The story is really to be based on the movement of freedom seekers across the country. And the networks of response are what come to be called the Underground Railroad. The movement came first, then the response, not the other way around. Got it? You with me? All right, good. Another point while I'm on this. In the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, there was a growing appreciation of that slavery was a bad thing. And by the time you get into the 1840s, particularly in a lot of the northern states, probably the majority of people thought, you know, slavery is a kind of bad thing, but it's a long way away. It's in the South that doesn't touch us at all. You know, that was the, the thought. Slavery is a kind of bad thing. Within that, there was a fairly small group that said, we have to deal with this. We have to take the social and political and policy decisions to end this. Those are the abolitionists. And then within the abolitionists, there was a very small group of white and black abolitionists that said, we are willing to break the law to help folks. So the Underground Railroad was not a big movement, it's very small. Loads of people in the North and in Chicago were anti-slavery. A very small number were actually abolitionists were involved in the politics. And of those, a very small number were willing to say, we will break the law, okay? so. Hopefully you have those kind of frames. Alrighty, now, um, whenever we start talking about this, it's always crucial to remember 
why it is that people were seeking their freedom and that part of the great dilemma that we're still trying to figure out is how to talk about slavery in this country. And I mean, that's a the current issue right now in, face, in the front of all of us. And there are, I think there are really kind of three really significant components that, that I like to stress. And that is recognize that a whole bunch of people get kidnapped, uh, are taken prisoners or whatever, and they are sold into slavery in Africa, often by other Africans. And secondly, there is a huge number of people that are transported across the Atlantic close to 12 million people were brought across the Atlantic Ocean. Of those, about 400,000 come to what we know as the United States. And the third great element in this story is this element of people owning other people. And I think we, we can't even begin to understand what that is. I mean, how do we even imagine that? Somebody owns another person. And, and they are, you know, when I do my research over the years, when I'm looking at research prior 1850, I'm not looking at population records anymore. I'm looking at property records. And it's there within the estate sales and the tax records with the horses and the cattle and the sheep. That's where the slaves are. So it's, you know, there is this powerful kind of thing. And interestingly, uh, this is a this is an image from the Daily Defender, Chicago Daily Defender, 1941, and it is a pretty graphic understanding of the willingness to do you know anything, any means necessary to find your freedom. And you know, fortunately, there are some folks willing to help. But I've always thought, you know, 1941, the Chicago Defender, what an interesting image and and way of thinking about the power. Uh, the power of the Underground Railroad. Okay, now, <clears throat> where did it happen? Some of us were talking earlier about the fact that a bunch of folks seeking their freedom went to Mexico, and they went all over. People went into Mexico, uh, people uh, escaping their enslavement went into the West to uh, hang out with Native Americans. Uh, people went into the Caribbean. There were folks that uh, commandeered ships and went up the coast. The vast majority went up into the Northern states. And I've added those blue lines to kind of give you a sense of the variety of directions in which people seeking their freedom took off. And there was particularly in the middle of the country in the Mississippi River Valley, there was a pretty good information network so that people kind of knew where they could head. And uh, they had some directions and so much of it was going up the Mississippi River Valley uh, to find their freedom. Well, as long as I have the map up, oh, by the way, um, on each of the maps, I've put a, um, um, I, you'll see a little yellow box that tells you who did the map. I thought you guys would appreciate it. Anyway, um, the thing, the other thing that's really interesting about this map is to look closely at the state of Illinois, because Illinois had several hundred miles of boundary with slave states, Missouri and Kentucky. And remember that Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware did not secede. They did not leave the Union. And so part of what happens when the Civil War comes is you still got this kind of problem of slave states and, and free states. Um, <clears throat> but because of those boundaries, and it was a matter of getting across the Mississippi River, that the majority of people, uh, enslaved people that make it into the Chicago region have come out of Missouri. Uh, an awful lot come up throughout the Mississippi River Valley, but most of them out of Missouri. The other thing that's interesting is to realize how profoundly diverse the state of Illinois was. Look at Cairo and the Southern counties and Cairo and the Southern counties are further south than most of the state of Virginia. You know, we're talking about deep south. And uh, in fact, when the, when the state seceded in 61, uh, there was a county in Southern Illinois that voted to secede from uh, Illinois and um, the federal troops showed up and they thought better of it and changed their mind. Um, but anyways, I want you to get a, um, uh, you know, get a sense of the, of the, of the range of that. Um, am I, uh, I've lost my clicker. Bingo. Okay. Now, in terms of people coming up um, uh, the Mississippi River Valley, 
Uh, they came up for most of the states, but, but again, as I'd suggested, most came out of Missouri. And um, uh, my research suggests that six to 10,000 freedom seekers made their way into Illinois. Uh, and tragically, we don't know how many, I have not been able to put a number on how many got to Illinois and lost, were you know, recaptured or kidnapped or whatever and, and taken south. Um, and of those, my research suggests that uh, the 3,000 to 4,500 people escaping their enslavement came right through uh, the Chicago region. And uh, this map is, my final book is coming out this summer uh, onward to Chicago. And I, I engaged a map maker in California, Hal Jefferson, Jefferson uh, and Hal made a set of maps for the book. And I wanted to show you, but I think this is helpful in terms of giving you a sense that from Chicago, the Chicago region, the bulk of folks went overland to Detroit. Why was Detroit important? Because it was just getting across the river to freedom in Canada. There also was a significant number of folks that went by ship from Chicago to um, uh, in, into Canada. Uh, there's a wonderful story of, uh, there were two captains, Captain Walker and Captain God, senior moment. Anyway, uh, so Captain Walker is, is on a ship. This is about 1847, I think. So Captain Walker's in a ship and he's got a fugitive in the bottom of the ship that he's carrying to Detroit. And on the ship, he has a bunch of Southern wealthy families who are touring the United States. And they're in the staterooms up on the top of the ship. And somehow or another, they begin to hear a rumor that there is a fugitive, a stowaway on the ship. And so they start to grumble. And, and so Captain Walker sets it up and he's sitting with all these Southerners. And he says, and somebody comes in, whispers in his ear and says, there's a stowaway, there's a black guy. And Captain Walker stands up and says, I'm not gonna have stowaways on my ship. The next port we get to, I'm throwing them off this ship. And just so happens that the ship ends up in a little port called Collingwood on the Canada side of Lake Huron. And so in front of everybody, the captain drags the poor you know, fugitive out of the basement and takes him off and kicks him into freedom. <laughs> um, but as indicated, most of the folks came, uh, um, came the other way. Um, my research has found that there are probably 40 places, more than 40 places, including 20 places in the city where we have very good documentary evidence of uh, freedom seekers who were here in these places. There are places where they stayed, where they traveled to, they're connected with people, where they found various kinds of assistance. And as you can see, they're all over the place. Uh, and as I indicated in Chicago, there are 20 specific sites where we know freedom seekers found, uh, found assistance. Um, there were two broad streams of movement for people, these several thousand people that came out of the South, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, the outbreak of the Civil Wars in 61. And there were two broad streams of movement. As they came up the Mississippi River Valley, they had to come to Chicago and this transition point because further down, you could, go, you could go to the east and go north, but once you got into Northern Illinois, there was the, the great Kankakee swamps. And this whole area was swamped. And the only way to get through, to get below the lake and above the swamps was in this 20 mile corridor. And so in 1825, the federal government creates the Detroit to Chicago military road, which runs from Chicago uh, coming to the lake and then around the bottom of the lake to the city. And then across the Southern part of Cook County and going across Will County was the old historic Salk Trail. And so there were a number of people that were heading in our direction that headed for Chicago. Chicago was a sanctuary city, a place of safety. There were at some times a very good reason to avoid Chicago because of slave catchers or because of the conditions. And so people coming up, uh, some, and my research suggests that, that probably uh, 500 to 1,200 people over those decades 
just came straight east on their way to Detroit and freedom in Canada. And that somewhere around 2000 to 3000, actually in one way or another made their way into Chicago and then around. And in terms of understanding the Underground Railroad in Illinois, we need to understand both of those, uh, uh, both of those patterns. The, um, <clears throat> that Northern stream uh, followed up the, uh, along the i and Canal and, uh, and then followed that historic uh, Detroit to Chicago military highway. It used to go right along the lake. Some of you may know this story. It used to go right along the lake and then it was moved inland in 18, 1837. Um, key to that was movement on the i and Canal. Uh, this building, uh, another day trip, you should go to Lockport, Illinois, and visit the, um, uh, the, the Will County Historical Society Museum. It's a really cool little place. It's in this building, uh, built in 1837. This was the most important public building in Illinois, in Northern Illinois. Uh, it was the headquarters for the i and Canal. And when Chicago was still kind of a little village, uh, we have done the research and to honor the freedom seekers that uh, traveled up the i &M Canal, this has been designated by the National Park Service uh, as an Underground Railroad official site. Now, so how did people get to Chicago? There were a number that came up both on the canal itself and on the roads adjacent to the canal. And then there were a set of roads, think over here, think Ottawa, Peru, those places on the Illinois River. And it's from those places that there were, there were roads that led up into Chicago, coming through the Naper settlement, which becomes Naperville, coming through uh, Aurora. And there were some few that uh, came uh, far north in the region around Galena, and then just came straight east across Northern Illinois and came into Chicago. So that's how folks were getting to Chicago on this Northern route. And then from Chicago, they went straight south on the Chicago to Detroit road. Um, when they got to Chicago, there were very well established networks of support by the, the evolved over time. They changed over time and they evolved. There was always a small black community in Chicago uh, as early as the, you know, the 1830s. And in the mid 1830s, um, black families in Chicago were actively involved in responding to freedom seekers. And one of the remarkable people uh, is Louis Isbell. And of course, you all know Louis Isbell, right? Hmm? Now, probably one of the most fascinating people that's ever lived in Chicago, and nobody knows his story. You know, uh, he was the he was the son probably of his owner, uh, but uh, his mother was enslaved, and he was enslaved until he was eleven years old. They moved into uh, Illinois, and his owner, possibly his father, uh, gave him his freedom. And as a young man, he came to Chicago and he immediately got involved in uh, assisting freedom seekers that were coming through the city. And uh, Louis Isbell lived uh, until 1905 and he had his fist in everything in the black community for you know, 70 years or something. Uh, one of these people that, you know, if I were in charge, every kid in Chicago would know the story of Louis Isbell. I could go on for three hours about this guy. Really, really. Uh, interesting character. Um, they, they got things started in the 1830s, the mid 1830s in assisting responding to freedom seekers. A remarkable group of young white families settled in Chicago in the late, in the mid to late 1830s. And these were families, almost all of them out of New York and New England that had come and they came with fairly general kind of anti-slavery notions. And as the abolitionist movement started to build in the late 1830s, these were the people that got involved in that. They started encountering freedom seekers and realized they had to break the law. And they became the heart of the white leadership uh, that, that was involved with the Underground Railroad. They were led by Dr. Charles Dyer and his wife, Louisa, and uh, a remarkable group of people. Uh, just really people. And of course, Alan Pinkerton is probably a name you know, the, you know, the private eye guy. And um, Alan Pinkerton got his start in clandestine work assisting freedom seekers in Chicago. Uh, and these folks were, they, they came by 1837, they were organizing. By 1840, they had a regular network of support set up and they were communicating with people around Illinois 
that they could assist freedom seekers that came to Chicago. Then in 1845, so that was about 1837, the whites get organized. And they worked a little bit with those black leaders like Louis Isbell and others. In 1845, there's a remarkable group of young black families that settle in Chicago. And in a very similar pattern, they become deeply, deeply involved in responding to the, uh, uh, to the needs of freedom seekers. Uh, and at the leadership of that are uh, John and Mary Richardson Jones. Some of you may know those, those portraits that are at the Chicago History Museum. Uh, they're just an absolutely remarkable family. Uh, John Jones was the first black elected official in Cook County in the 1870s. And uh, there are a remarkable cycle of stories about um, the Jones family and their relations. And it turns out that Louis Isbell marries Mary Jones's sister. And then there's another family. And so all these people end up being related to each other. Uh, they provided leadership across the black community in the 40s and 50s and continued, they all stayed and, uh, and continued to provide leadership through the 60s and 70s. Uh, Emma and Isaac Atkinson were very dear friends of theirs and uh, the uh, uh, Reverend and Mrs. Ab Abram Hall, uh, all of these, these were kind of the key leaders with a group of about 20 black families that were deeply involved in this. And they worked together through two congregations, uh, Quinn Chapel, uh, which still exists, and Olivet Baptist Church in the 1850s was Zor Baptist Church. And those two congregations served as the kind of the base for operations. And part of what's been fascinating in my research is to find that in the 1850s, these white leaders and these black leaders are working together. And I really think an argument can be made that the first major civil rights movement in Chicago was the racially diverse movement in support of freedom seekers by these white and black families. And these were people that, that somehow broke the barriers of race to be able to deal with each other as human beings and to respond to the human needs of people that are coming through. So there's a remarkable cycle of stories with all that. Now, the whole issue was to make tracks for Canada. And the Chicago was a sanctuary city. A number of people felt relatively safe here, but the big issue was to get on, uh, get on to Detroit. Many went via the lake and many went uh, overland. For those that were going overland, they, uh, they would travel on this historic Chicago to Detroit road, which went directly south out of the city. And from, remember Chicago in the 1840s and 50s, Chicago is about the size of the loop. And so it was 15 miles of open country to get to the Little Calumet River. Today, that's the southern edge of Chicago. But this was you know, open country. What happens down here is the unique settlement of a bunch of Dutch immigrants. They settle in what becomes Roseland and they settle in what becomes South Holland. That's not a surprise. Uh, but so these Dutch immigrants uh, settle there and they are they settle there because of the land, they settle there because it's on the, uh, on the Detroit to Chicago Road. And a couple of families speak English, particularly the family of, of Cornelius and Marche Kuiper and Jan and Enche Tun. And they speak English and they become kind of the spokespeople for the community. And it turns out that as freedom seekers are, um, are walking to Detroit and freedom, they come down and they run into Cornelius, and uh, right here at the, at the Little Calumet River, uh, there's a bridge at Indiana Avenue that becomes very significant because those hundreds of freedom seekers walking to Detroit all had to cross that bridge. And we're gonna visit that bridge in a minute. So uh, Jan Tun and, and Cornelius, and there's Jan and Angie, um, uh, and they had, uh, uh, Jan, Jan and Angie had their farm right on the Little Calumet River. This is about six blocks from the Indiana Avenue Bridge. And they, they host uh, uh, fugitives that are coming through. Uh, sometimes um, uh, Cornelius Kuiper, who acted as kind of a community constable, was bringing people to the tons for, for safety. So we did an awful lot of research on this. And uh, this is now, <clears throat> the ton farm, part of it is now 
what's called Chicago's Finest Marina, which is incidentally the most historic black owned marina in the Chicago region. Uh, it was established in the 1950s because black people who were interested in boats couldn't get, they couldn't go to regular marinas. So a black family established this. About 10 years ago, a fellow who's now become a good friend, Ron Gaines and his family bought the marina and they are rehabbing it. And it's a really glorious site. And it turns out that the Tun Farm is right where this marina is. And, and on, on Ron Gaines' family's farm is where we established last year a uh, historic marker on Freedom Seekers and the Underground Railroad to really mark the importance of this place. And we had quite a celebration. There's Juliana Stratton, Lieutenant Governor. That's Ron Gaines, the owner. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Robin Kelly, Cook County Commissioner uh, Donna Miller. This is my colleague, Tom Shepard. That is Bart Throntwin, the, uh, the consulate for the Dutch, the Dutch consulate in Chicago. Um, and, and so we've really been able to create this as a place. And if any of you ever interested, we do a series of tours uh, of this down there in this area. We're, we're sponsored by the Chicago, by the Cook County Forest Preserve people. And if you go onto our website, uh, you can find out about that. This also has been designated as a, a site on the Network to Freedom by the National Park Service. Now, just six blocks west of the Tun Farm is the Indiana Avenue Bridge. And when we do our tours, I take people to this bridge because as far as I know, it is the only place in Illinois where I can say right here, 500 to 800 people walked for freedom right here. This kind of dilapidated bridge is about the seventh bridge that's been at that site. If, uh, if you're ever on the Metro Electric, uh, when you're crossing the Little Calumet River, the Calsag Channel, if you look east, the first bridge you see is the Indiana Avenue Bridge. And it's at the forgotten edge of Chicago. Ron Gaines's Chicago's Finest Marina is on a dirt road. In Chicago, there is a set of dirt roads. You know, 134th place in Chicago is a dirt road with potholes. They've no, there's no, you know, there's no gas, there's no water service. You know, it's you you, you get down there and it's a really, you know. It is, it is the forgotten part of Chicago. It's right next to Alt Road Gardens, if any of you know that area. Um, okay, so to orient you a bit about the things I've been pointing to, the Cornelius, the, the black line was the, this was the, the, the road, the Church of Chicago Road. Uh, Kuiper's home was up here. It's right a, just a few blocks from the Pullman Historic Park. The Tun Farm was right there on the Little Calumet, and that bridge is right, uh, uh, is right there. The, um, okay, I'm watching my time. Um, very interesting thing happened to me in 2011. A young man who was a, a, a senior in high school in South Holland uh, got in touch with me and he said, I would like to do my, my Eagle Scout project, something to honor the Dutch families that helped with the Underground Railroad. And so we did this kind of amazing process with a bunch of white families and black families and with, with Lerone Branch and his family and all this. And we got uh, the great collaboration of the First Reformed Church in South Holland, which is one just big, big, impressive church. It was started in the 1850s by Jan Tan and Cornelius Kuiper. So that church gave graciously gave to us a plot of land and we established this underground memorial garden. And uh, a, a group of black urban gardeners uh, tended with native Illinois plants, plants that freedom seekers would have seen if they come. So if you're ever in South Holland, go to the First Reformed Church and you can see this. And you'll notice it has the, the classic railroad tracks going underground. There are a handful of, of memorials around the country to the underground railroad that have the tracks going underground. So that's how you, you know, that's how you know it's worked. Uh, okay, 
Going east across uh, Northwest Indiana, we've ident- been able to identify a whole bunch of places on both of our, on both of the, uh, of the streams, both those coming down the Detroit Chicago Road. Every, every arrow represents a place where we know freedom seekers found real assistance. And down here is the Sauk Trail route that went across. The Sauk Trail, as I had indicated, was a, uh, an, a Native American trail hundreds of years old. And there is one existing picture from 1921 which shows the historic trail that over centuries became a groove in the land. Um, in Will County, there were a number of families, including the Havens family in New Lenox and other places in Homer Township and Burkina and Joliet where people were involved. The, the really interesting Underground Railroad site along the Salt Trail is the site of the McCoy Homestead. This is a pretty poor picture, but you can get a, a bit of a sense of the homestead on the Salt Trail. And if you're driving on the Salt Trail these days, just east of Park Forest, you will notice a ledge of land right next to the road, and that's where the McCoy homestead was. We know that well over 100 freedom seekers found assistance at the McCoy homestead. And right now we're trying to, that's my next hopefully big project to get uh, recognized as an Underground Railroad site. Okay, the Salt Trail continues into um, uh, South Chicago Heights, crosses the historic Vincennes Trace Hubbard's Trail, where the Brown family were also assisting freedom seekers. And down in Crete, there was a unique group of radicals in the, that started a congregational church in 1839. 1841, they issued one of the first statements in Illinois opposing slavery. And uh, that church was very uh, instrumental in, uh, in providing assistance. And we have now gotten that church uh, and that cemetery designated on the National Park Service uh, listing. Um, and here's another uh, map that came out of a journal, again, to remind you of this, the movement of folks, those that came up into Chicago and then followed the Chicago Detroit Road and those that came across on the Salt Trail, all moving in, you know, all moving in that direction. Now, <clears throat> The, one of the major projects we're embarking on, which I envision that in five years, we will have a set of maps and a guidebook following the footsteps of freedom seekers. And we have identified along this trail, both that northern route and this more southerly route, we've identified probably 35 or 40 places that will become stops along the Chicago to Detroit Freedom Trail. And uh, that's our next big project. And we're, we're really excited about it. Now, all of these things I could talk about for hours and hours, but I wanna finish by just telling you two stories. And um, the, the, the reality is that all of these stories are in fact journey stories. How do we begin to understand the power for people of grabbing their freedom and finding their way, finding their own way? The, um, um, the most remarkable story, I think, is of Carolyn Quarles. I've written a book about this, which I have for sale, by the way. Um, the, um, uh, Carolyn was 16 years old. This picture is taken of her late in life. It's the only picture we have. Caroline was 16 years old when she decided she was gonna be a free human being. Um, she was the daughter of her master's son. Her master's son uh, decided uh, he was getting married. He was about 28. He decided he was getting married. He thought, well, gee, celebrate my marriage. Why don't I rape some of the slaves? And um, Caroline was a consequence. Her mother was a 17-year-old enslaved woman. And uh, Caroline was born. The son of her master's, the daughter of her master's son, grew up in their household with her free cousins. The same house. She grows up, beautiful young girl, long black hair, pale skin, freckles, blue eyes. She was enslaved in the house with her free cousins. And finally, at age 16, she had had enough. And she decided that she was going to gain her freedom. Also, we don't know this for sure, but it seems pretty obvious that Caroline understood that as a beautiful young woman, 16 years old, If she were kidnapped, she would be sold into slavery in New Orleans in a fancy house 
and that was not a life that she wanted to have. So she decides she's gonna be a free person. So using her uh, capacity to pass, she goes down to the, uh, the docks and buys a ticket on a riverboat heading north. And she heads up from St. Louis, 1843. She goes up the Mississippi River. She gets to Galena and gets off the, uh, gets off the boat. And uh, there's one black guy living in Galena. And he rushes up, he says, we've heard of you, you're passing. We know about you, the slave catchers are on your trail. You gotta get out of here. So this guy gets her on a, a stagecoach and she ends up going to Milwaukee. And the white abolitionists in Milwaukee had never seen a fugitive slave. And they were kind of puzzled, what do we do? So they spent about three weeks hiding her and figuring out what to do. And they decide one of their number will be her escort and take her uh, on to Detroit and then freedom in Canada. And so the two of them, they somebody lets them have a buggy and some horses and they head out and they come down around Chicago. And because in 1843, Chicago was fairly dangerous for freedom seekers. Uh, they decided to avoid the city. And so they came down through Dundee, Naperville, down through uh, Lockport and Harvard Township. They stayed overnight in the creek. Remember I told you about the creek church? Those are the people she stayed with. And they had a, some really, really interesting conversations. She went on then over to Northwest Indiana and across Michigan uh, to freedom in Canada. The, um, It's a stunning story. And um, I uh, oftentimes when I tell this, I, I use that as a central story and elaborate and really get into all the details. But can you imagine 16 years old, 1843, deciding that she was going to be free? And one of the remarkable things about Caroline's story is that her last name is Quarles. The family spelled it with an L-E-S. She spelled it L-L-S at the end. Um, they were very proud of their Revolutionary War heritage. Caroline's white grandfather and grand uncle had served with George Washington in Valley Forge. Can you imagine? And they had they lived in Virginia, they knew the Jeffersons and all those people. Then the Quarles moved to St. Louis. But they were very proud of their Revolutionary War heritage. And so this young enslaved girl, she understood what her white family was about. And in 1843, when she left, she made her own declaration and she left on the 4th of July. Can you imagine? You know, okay, family, I'm going to leave on the 4th of July. I'm going to declare my independence. You know, just, you know, just amazing. Um, final story. In 1841, John and Eliza Little were enslaved on adjoining farms in western Tennessee. Uh, John was um, what Evidently, his owners considered a difficult person. Uh, he had he carried scars on his back. He carried a bullet fragment in his shoulder all of his life. Uh, he was a very strong human being. Years later, John Little said, I remember saying to those slavers, there isn't an ounce, there isn't a drop of white blood in me. I'm the son of African princes. And you can imagine he got in trouble. Well, John and Eliza realized that if they were going to have a life together, they had to escape. And so they escaped. And some of you geographers may know there's this weird thing in the United States that in the middle, most of our rivers flow south. But in the middle, the Tennessee River and the, the, uh, the Cumberland flow north. And uh, so, the, and you know, here's the... Um, you know, the Cumberland comes out of the Appalachians and then it flows north up the Ohio. The Tennessee comes out and it flows north up to the Ohio River. So John and Eliza were able to go downriver up north, if that works, okay? And they, uh, you know, they took off, 1841. They, they made it up the Tennessee River and they got to the Ohio River and there was a large swampy area. 
And John, years later, he told people, we got to that swampy area and I put Eliza on a log and we had two little satchels and I put them on the log behind her and I pushed that log through the swamp and I knew that at any moment, if I misstepped, I would lose everything that I loved. We made it to the swamp. They got to the Ohio River, borrowed a boat, got across the Ohio River. They're, they're encamped on the north side of the Ohio River and some other freedom seekers show up and they're talking and these other people say, God, this has been really hard. I think we're gonna go back. I'm gonna turn myself in. Maybe my master won't be too cool to me. And Eliza Little said to them, I know where we have been and I know what we must do. And if need be, I will walk barefoot to Chicago to find my freedom. John and Eliza Little in 1841 walked 370 miles to find their freedom in Chicago. Remarkable. Now we've got loads and loads of stories. The part of what we're reframing is this old notion that, oh, the Underground Railroad is all mysterious. We don't know anything about it. We know an awful lot. It just takes a lot of work to figure this stuff out. I've been at it for 20 years. Um, but it's a very exciting cycle of stories. I probably have now about 60 individual stories, like the stories of Caroline and John and Eliza. And I think it's really important that we are reframing this and seeing the Underground Railroad and the movement of freedom seekers as this kind of absolutely remarkable part of our American history. And that there were these remarkable people that grabbed for their freedom, that seized their freedom. And it was very risky and very dangerous. And it was all against the law and they did it. And as they came into other places, there were white abolitionists and black abolitionists that said, we're gonna break the law. We're gonna help these people because everyone has a right to freedom. And so, um, and so we carry on. And um, do you have any questions? My evaluation of the Underground Railroad in Cincinnati. Um, a number of years ago, uh, a real effort was made uh, by legislators in the state of um, Ohio to establish a museum in a place there ought to be a great museum right there on the Ohio River. Unfortunately, what it did was that it sucked millions of dollars from all over the country into that museum. And they, they don't seem to be particularly interested in providing research support or anything else. It's a great museum to visit once. And if you're ever in Cincinnati, go visit it. It's a great place. But is it a resource for any of us? No. Yes. And what I remember about it that was a this contrast is, to Cincinnati. She's, she's talking about New Albany, Indiana. Indiana. Mm -hmm. and, and it seemed to um, emphasize the way African Americans on the Indiana side of the river helped the crossers of the river. And it was something really left out in that much larger Cincinnati Museum. Yeah, that's right. And I think that, that as, as I'm trying to do here, in terms of reinforcing the importance of the Black leadership, in the Underground Railroad in Chicago, that's in that part of Southern Indiana, it's really unique that there were, and again, there, it was, there was strong black leadership and there was an interesting collaboration of white and black leadership. Okay, okay, don't miss it, don't miss it. Yes. Every story is unique. Yes. Say I'm a slave in Alabama, and let's say I have a wife and two children. Uh, how do I find out about this network that you described? Is there support in Alabama, word of mouth, that would get me on the path to yeah. uh, access 
asking us to lead to the networks. And um, how do I know about it? How do I access it, basically? What's the process generally? Right. It, they asking about generally, what is the process through which people, if you will, found their freedom? And the what seems very clear now is that particularly up and down the Mississippi River Valley, there was a tremendous amount of communication among free black individuals, enslaved individuals, and that people knew the story. We have examples of people in the 1820s heading north with maps that they had, you know, people had drawn maps for them how to get. So it appears that from the 18, into the 1830s, I think, there was a general kind of recognition of if you head up the Mississippi River Valley, you're going to find places of assistance. And um, the, uh, I've been fascinated by the stuff that I found about the interaction between uh, free people and enslaved people uh, in the whole kind of Mississippi uh, region. That Mississippi Valley culture is I think a very, a river culture, very, very interesting. I think that contributed a great deal. The, um, um, so I think that, you know, our sense is that there was a good deal of that kind of informal sharing that went on, but also there was the, the um, how do you say, the allure of the North, you know, where is freedom? Freedom is North. And so there was, for some people, as they started to look around, the question then became, well, how do I get north? And interestingly, like we talked earlier, for people in Texas, one of the questions was, how do I get to Mexico? Because that's where freedom was. Um, so I, you know, I think there was this kind of general awareness, and, and people were checking in with each other and, and getting the word you know, being passed down through, um, uh, through this river culture. I think that's a very important piece of it. And then when they get into, they're pretty much traveling on their own. I want to emphasize that a large number of folks seeking their freedom were traveling independently. They were traveling at night. They were scrounging in people's barns and, you know, and they were people that had lots of agricultural and hunting skills and all that. So they were living off the land, getting north. It appears that into the 1840s, when people got into central Illinois, they began to relax and find enough assistance that they could travel during the daytime. And all the evidence we have is that people had to be very discreet, but they could travel during the daytime. In Northern Illinois, and particularly in the Chicago region, um, the Underground Railroad was an open secret. Everybody knew about this. And I always like to tell people, there are a few of you that will remember the 60s. Um, but you may remember that smoking marijuana was really illegal and really serious and really dangerous. However, everybody knew somebody that knew somebody. Remember? Of course, none of you ever smoked, but remember? We all knew, oh yeah, they're, they're you know, you want to talk, you go see Sam. You know, there was that kind of a sense. I think that the Underground Railroad was very much like that. Everybody knew somebody. And the coverage in the newspapers was very public. And this was, you had to be discreet. It was serious. It was illegal. But it was very active across uh, Northern Illinois. And a footnote on that is part of that activity was that the Black leadership much more than the white leadership, the black leadership was willing to be armed. And they were very serious about this. And they would, we have examples of people discussing, should they kill the slave catchers or not? You know, I mean, this was very, very serious stuff. Oh, oh, right. Uh, you had mentioned or maps and and illustrations uh obviously waterways were a very important part of of the underground network were these um boatmen captains were they in it economically um or were they in it uh sort of philosophically um how like how did these people travel along the waterways the uh, uh how did people travel on the waterways um they're the, the, the captains we know about in Chicago 
were very much in the abolitionist camp. And, uh, and the stories that we have, um, there is some indication in the stories that, that other abolitionist actors would get together and, and help pay for the passage. Uh, uh, when you get into the late 1850s, there were being, they were very straightforward about just paying for passage. You, know, you just buy a ticket and you get on the ship. Also, there was an interesting, um, there, were, there were little lake steamers that went along the bottom edge of Lake Michigan. So Chicago, uh, the dunes, Michigan City, New Buffalo, and they would regularly buy tickets for Freedom Seekers to take that. Once they got to New Buffalo, they could then get on a train straight to Detroit. Uh, so it was a mix, I, but there, uh, but we've got evidence of people um, very much in it philosophically, you know, because it was important. There's a, I have a great cycle of stories. I'll come back another time. Great cycle of stories about the INM Canal and, and people traveling both alongside and on the canal boats about how they were treated. There was another question over here. Yeah. Yeah. This will be the last. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okay, so that we're we have these freedom seekers traveling on the Underground Railroad. What was the mode of transportation? Were they walking this entire distance? With how were they? How were they being transported? The uh, it was as you can imagine a great variety of ways. That a, a tremendous number of people, in fact, were walking. There were people that uh, there were people in the Chicago area that organized buggies and wagons that would go south and pick up freedom seekers and carrying them north. Uh, after 1855, uh, my research suggests that probably somewhere around 100 people came out of the South on the trains. And uh, a wonderful story about a guy that cons his way out of the Illinois Central and gets to Chicago and, on the Illinois Central. Um, but so people were traveling on the trains. Once they got to Chicago, as I indicated, roughly a third um, went by ship around Michigan to Detroit. The other two thirds uh, went overland and would have gone down across the bridge and, and followed other routes. But it was it was very you know it was very mixed. Some people came with horses. Uh, we've got we've got stories of uh, of freedom seekers coming to Chicago you know on horseback you know a group a group of horse horseback people. So it was very very mixed, but a lot walked. Um, I have two um, with me. I have two books: um, the story of Caroline Corals, and I've got my my little book on the history of the Underground Railroad south of Chicago. If any of you are dying to read a lot more detail in stories, uh, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. And uh, my big book is coming out in uh, September, and I'm excited about that. And it's great to be with you all. <laughs>